really appreciate everyone taking the time today to um, join us for this really exciting panel discussion. Um, so uh, I'm going to uh, just introduce myself and go over the agenda for our webinar today. Um, but my name is Samantha Miller. I uh, work with the National Wildlife Federation and I'm a communications and partnerships manager. And I've been working with all the wonderful folks that you see on the call here today to um, organize a really engaging panel discussion around how um, us as gardeners, you know, individuals, and people working in community organizations can help support monarch butterflies and other pollinators by, you know, being very uh, particular about the native plants that you choose. So um, I'm really excited to have this conversation today. All right, so just a quick overview of our agenda. Um, I'm going to, uh, we're gonna hear some opening remarks from Rebecca Canonias Pinon, who here at the National Wildlife Federation um, leads our Monarch Recovery Strategy and um, our Monarch Stewards Program as well. Um, and then we're going to um, go into some brief presentations that highlights our expert panelists that we have on the call today. Um, and then we're going to dive right into our panel discussion, and then we'll wrap up the call with just sharing some resources out to folks, um, and then uh, just giving closing remarks. Uh, so with that, I'm going to pass the baton over to uh, Rebecca Canonias Pinon, um, and she will give us opening remarks for this panel discussion. At the National Wildlife Federation, we have closely followed the status of the migratory monarch butterfly. It has been almost 10 years since the monarch was petitioned to be protected under the Endangered Species Act. Fish and Wildlife Service will release its final listing decision with proposed rules during the fiscal year of 2024. A wake-up call was the decision of the International Union for Conservation of Nature to classify the migratory monarch as an endangered species. This decision does not have a federal jurisdiction, but definitely is an indicative of the federal status of the monarch. Since 2015, and even before that year, the National Wildlife Federation has supported the conservation of the monarch butterfly through underground conservation efforts and educational and outreach programs. NWF believes in the power of partnering with other organizations state and federal agencies and community groups to advance our conservation efforts. Please take some time to look at our programs that support the conservation of the monarch butterfly and all pollinators. Most recently, we have created our federation-wide core monarch recovery strategy to amplify internally and externally our monarch conservation work. Our recovery strategy has six pillars, and one of them is based on strengthening and amplifying partnerships with other monarch conservation organizations. Through the monarch recovery strategy, we have collaborated with many other partners by providing science-based expertise and years of experience on monarch conservation to create and update conservation plans. I am honored to say that NWF collaborated together with many other partners on the most recent update of the Mid-America Monarch Conservation Strategy that will be released soon. Last year, NWF was at the table with many other experts on monarch conservation to create a summary report that included 11 recommendations that Senator Jeff Merkley from the state of Oregon could implement in the next three to six months to make significant steps towards long-term progress on monarch butterfly conservation. NWF is providing feedback to relevant bills that will help support further conservation efforts to save the monarch butterfly. For five remarkable years, the Monarch Stewards Program has been a beacon of pollinator conservation. Over 500 participants have joined us on this incredible journey, contributing to our shared mission of safeguarding monarchs and nurturing all pollinators. Through their passion, we have achieved significant milestones and made a lasting impact. 
for program empowers volunteers with the skills and knowledge needed to create native pollinator friendly habitats. Please take some time to get familiar with the three workshops, the introduction to monarch conservation, community science, and gardening for monarchs and other wildlife with native plants. In this panel discussion, we aim to encourage everyone to continue using native plants to conserve and protect the monarch butterfly and other pollinators. Based on research studies and outcomes, we will explain why native plants better support our native pollinators. We will also encourage our audience to create pollinator-friendly habitats throughout the U.S. using native plants. We will explain as well why monarch caterpillars are picky eaters, and we hope to deepen your understanding of the interdependence between humans and pollinators and learn how you can make a positive impact on monarch butterflies and on pollinators through mindful planting. Thank you for being here today, and we hope that you will enjoy this panel. Thank you so much, Rebecca, for welcoming us into the call and giving us a little rundown of um, where we're at in the space of monarch conservation. Um, so to move on, um, we're going to start with, uh, with a brief presentation from uh, Stephanie Frisky from the Xerxes Society. Um, she is an agronomist, agronomist and native plant material specialist with the, um, the Xerxes Society for Intervertebrate Conservation. Hi, I'm Stephanie Frischi with the Xerxes Society, a science-based organization focused on the conservation of invertebrates and their habitats. We are named for the Xerxes blue, which was the first butterfly to go extinct in the United States. And when Xerxes was founded 51 years ago by concerned butterfly conservationists, the goal was to prevent the extinction of any further butterfly species. We've since grown to be the largest pollinator conservation program in the world, and much of our habitat work is focused on native plants and native plant materials supply. This is, was involved in 2014 with the initial petition to have the monarch butterfly listed under the Endangered Species Act, and I mentioned this since our panel today is focused on milkweeds and monarch butterflies. The data that went to inform parts of that petition came from the Western monarch count. And this is how the size and health of the Western population is assessed each winter by a series of well-trained community science volunteers. In recent years, those data have indicated a precipitous decline in the size of the Western population and so these priority action zones have been enumerated. And for that light color in the early breeding zone, the recommendation there is to protect and plant pesticide-free early season native milkweed and nectar plants. Xerxes is involved in this particular action through our projects with several different native seed producers in California to increase the supply of species like California milkweed shown here and the nectar plants mule fat in the lower right. We also have several technical guides available for milkweed seed producers. Xerxes has a lot of publications available. Uh, they're all as free PDFs that can be downloaded from our website. Wanted to continue just touching on pesticide contamination here. In retail nurseries where milkweed is sold as a monarch host plant, this study found that 100% of the plants that were sampled in 33 stores across 15 states had some level of of pesticide contamination. So this was quite concerning. And our pesticide reduction team has a, an initiative going to work with the consumer side as well as the supplier side on reducing those types of pesticide contamination and growing and offering even more truly pollinator friendly plants. 
We have a series, a regional series of recommended native plants for pollinators and beneficial insects. We also have this group of uh, milkweed, roadside milkweed fact sheets for every region in the lower 48 states. I also want to uh, give a shout out to this habitat assessment guide for yards, gardens, and parks, where it really walks you through looking at habitat through the eyes of pollinators in each of these areas in ways that you can emphasize or improve those resources there. We published a book, 100 Plants to Feed the Monarch, and there we talk about the monarch biology and creating monarch habitat as well as several profiles on species in the genus uh, Asclepius, some of the non-milkweed but closely related host plant genera, and then um, nectar, nectar plants. So I have just a few pages shown here on these slides of some of those garden designs, what a profile looks like here for California milkweed as an example, and what one of the nectar plant profiles looks like. And finally, after you're inspired to look for these and use these native plants, we have two tools to help connect you with suppliers. The directory has about 10 different pull-down menus that you can use to filter, including the pesticide use or pest management practices of the supplier. And then milkweed finder, as the name implies, more precisely, helps you locate particular species of milkweed, whether that's as plants or seeds. So thank you for the opportunity to join you all here. And I look forward to our continued discussion in the panel. Wonderful. That was a great presentation um, from Stephanie. So thank you so much. Our next panelist is um, Amanda Barth, and she is a rare insect Activation Coordinator at Utah State University and is part of Utah's Rare Insect Conservation Program. So we're going to hear a little bit more about her work in uh, the West from uh, Western Monarchs. Hi everyone, my name is Amanda Barth and I'm very pleased to have this opportunity to share a little bit about state-led Western Monarch conservation efforts. I'm the chair of the Western Monarch and Native Insect Pollinator Working Group which is part of WAFWA, and that's the Western Association of Fish and Wildlife Agencies. And I'm based in Utah where I coordinate the Rare Insect Conservation Program through Utah State University and the Division of Wildlife Resources. WAFWA's Western Monarch and Native Insect Pollinator Working Group formed in 2017 with an initial goal of creating a conservation plan for Western monarchs. This plan provides a clear background on monarch population trends, threats uh, in the West, and conservation efforts currently being conducted with promising results. It also identifies short-term goals for habitat restoration and short-term population targets that would ind indicate improved trends. The bulk of the plan outlines approaches to protect and restore overwintering groves and conserve migratory habitats in natural lands, urban and industrial areas, rights of way, and agricultural habitat sectors. It's meant to be an all hands on deck approach. So it includes guidance for anyone at any scale, agencies, educators, community organizations, or individuals, and reporting your efforts to the Monarch Crucial Habitat Assessment Tool or CHAT are a great way to get your hard work on the map. While Western monarchs are still a central priority for the working group, we've expanded our scope to focus on other native insect pollinators that face extinction risk, and there are many. We are currently using the Monarch Conservation Plan model to develop a native insect cons pollinator conservation strategy. Because loss of available quality habitat is a major driver for monarch and other pollinator declines, it is a big focus in many of the strategies outlined in the plan. Fundamentally, the plan emphasizes providing quality habitat for monarchs that encourages natural migratory behavior through planting milkweed that is deciduous into breeding habitats so that adult monarchs will pursue available resources and move across the landscape. 
Native milkweed and diverse floral resources support healthy breeding behavior, reduced competition, and less disease transmission. And importantly, when breeding monarchs are fanned out across their range, this allows gene flow between the Eastern and Western populations. So there is more genetic diversity and a healthier overall migratory population. And since the Western monarch population overwinters mainly in California, quality habitat that promotes overwintering in historic groves should also be protected from development and include native floral resources that provide nectar, but not evergreen milkweed plants that might prompt overwintering adults to break diapause and lay their eggs too soon. The 50 year plan was developed with the understanding that a cycle of adaptive management would be necessary to ensure its success. Every five years, we aim to strategically review and update the plan with lessons learned during implementation, any changes to policy or regulations, outstanding data deficiencies, and the current monarch population status. This process allows us to improve and adjust our approach to be as efficient and effective as possible. Essentially, when you know better, you do better. The process of implementing the Western Monarch Conservation Plan has helped establish methods to track actions taken by stakeholders, specifically through the Monarch Chat Reporter tool, and helped identify areas where uh, improvements are necessary. We will officially begin our strategic review and revision of the plan next summer, but this approach is already being used to inform regional conservation strategies for pollinating insects and other invertebrates. I'm really proud to see the monarch conservation model being applied to insect conservation in general because monarchs get a lot of attention and help people get comfortable with the idea of protecting insects. So they're really serving as an ambassador species, and I like that a lot. Thank you so much, and thank you again to NWF for letting me share this with, all, with you all. I welcome you to reach out to me, and I encourage you to check out our working group website and the reporter tool for the Monarch Crucial Habitat Assessment. Thanks. Awesome. That was wonderful. Thank you so much, Amanda, for sharing your wisdom and the work that you're doing in the West. Um, we're going to go into our third presentation, um, which highlights uh, Texas master naturalist uh, Christine Anastas. Um, and I'll share quickly for the group as well that um, all of the resources and programs that have been shared during these presentations, and we'll discuss later on uh, during the panel discussion, will be shared out to all registrants and panelists. So don't worry about missing any of that great information. Um, so now we're going to hear um, a little bit about Monarch, uh, Monarch Community Science uh, with Christine Anastas. Hi, my name is Christine Anastas. I am not a scientist. I am a Texas Master Naturalist and a Master Gardener, and I've been doing Monarch Citizen Science Community Science projects for the last 10 years. I've realized very on, early on in my Monarch research and Monarch journey that we had a number of problems on the Texas Gulf Coast. We had an OE problem, a tropical milkweed problem, and a resident monarch problem. And I tried to work on these by giving giving presentations. So I started out by giving, you know, general monarch information, information on milkweed. And I always talk about the migration and the generations. This is something that no matter how many times I've given it, I seem to get different, different people. I always get gasped when people finally understand the way the generations work. And this is so important for us in Texas because once they understand the generations and the migration, they understand the monarchs shouldn't be here in the summer and should definitely not be here in the middle of winter laying eggs on tropical milkweed. So it's so, so important for me to include every every single time talking about the migration and the generations. I gave a lot of talks about growing native milkweed. When I first started in 2014, you couldn't find native milkweed plant or seeds in any of the nurseries within 100 miles. So this has been an uphill battle. We're starting to see quite a few of them now, but I still give presentations on how to find seeds locally, how to propagate those seeds. And I've given away many seeds to some of the local nurseries to get them started. I give presentations on some of the community science projects like the MLMP and definitely on the Project Monarch Health testing for OE. This is so important for us here in the Gulf Coast. 
We have a high rate of OE and I always show them what the, the, you know, the latest charts look like and explain the OE life cycle and how it affects the monarchs, how to test for it, how to look underneath the microscope before you even send those into Project Monarch Health so you can see yourself the OE spores if you have them. Really, really impactful and important for them. We still have a lot of people growing tropical milkweed. I'm giving talks on just about that now, about the studies of, about tropical milkweed, the correlation, the charts, like this chart's showing where tropical milkweed is growing outside of where it was originally planted, where it's escaping and growing into the wild. And, and it all correlates to where we have resident populations and we have high rates of OE. And we have a huge problem here with tropical milkweed being mis mislabeled. This year has been a terrible year for it. We are seeing tropical milkweed uh, labeled, and I'm not sure always if it's from the nursery or from the grower, but it's labeled Asclepius tuberosa. It's labeled Asclepius butterfly weed. It's labeled Asclepius Mexican native milkweed. All kinds of things to uh, trick people into thinking they're getting native milkweed because people are beginning to demand native milkweed. So I show how to tell the difference. And I don't give a talk without going through at least two more, if I have time, scientific studies, recent studies showing uh, correlation with OE, tropical milkweed, and problems. And then they always show this last, because I want to remind the people in Texas of how lucky we are that we not only see these migrators come through in the fall and they're looking for us as the last stop for fast food on the way to Mexico, so they have enough reserves to come back and visit us in the spring, but we get to see them in the spring and in other places that they never get to see this. So we're so important and I want them to know how important and that we could be the canary in the coal mine where tropical milkweed is not freezing here as we get warmer. This will this will extend to other places and that we need to to get a rain in on this now. And it's it's in within our power to control this. Thank you. Wonderful. That was a really, really great presentation from Christine. Um, I do see some folks that have raised their hand. Um, we're not going to have time to, to take questions from the group today, but we will be sending a survey um, after the presentation so that if you folks have any uh, questions that we didn't get to, um, you'll feel free to ask us. Um, at the moment, I'm going to pass it over to Rebecca Canonias pinon who will um, be moderating our panel discussion. Thank you, Sam, and thank you uh, to Stephanie, Amanda, and uh, Chris for their great presentations. Um, the first question, and please, Amanda, if you could please uh, help us with this, is, uh, is why is it important for people to use native plant species to support monarchs and other pollinators? Yeah, that's a really good question. So my thoughts on this are that native plants are really important for insect pollinators that are specialists, meaning that they've evolved to rely on certain types of plants for their nutritional needs. And monarchs are a really good example of this because their pollinator, or their, their caterpillars can only eat species of milkweeds. And a lot of other at-risk butterfly species are similar to that. They're specialized to certain host plants. And then there are hundreds of native bee species that specialize on the pollen of certain plants. And sometimes they are restricted to a single species or a genus. Sometimes other species can forage on any flowering plant within a certain family. Um, so as those plants disappear, the specialist species that rely on them will also disappear. And then for flowering plants that are an important nectar source for native pollinators, the timing of the resource availability matters a lot. And native species are more likely to be in bloom at the times that pollinators need that nectar, like when they're migrating uh, towards their overwintering grounds. And in general, uh, native plant species just support more wildlife than non-native species. Thank you. Stephanie, would you like to add something to the answer? I think that was a, a great answer. And I second everything there. They're also what the sense of place is. So native plants really are representative of the original or most recent 
natural communities that were there. And if you think of repairing a fabric, you want to do it with a similar type of thread to the original fabric. And native plants are the way to do that in our fragmented and disturbed ecosystems. I love that comparison. Thank you, Stephanie. Great, great comparison. So for all of us, I, I just would like to add uh, that coevolution is when two or more species that interact with each other on a regular ba basis evolve in response to each other's adaptations. So this is how plants and their pollinators have evolved or monarchs and their dependency on milkweed, especially as their host uh, plant. So we can summarize by saying that native wildlife in this particular case or beloved migratory monarch butterfly has co-evolved together with the native nectar plants and its native host the plant, the milkweed. So we will pass to the next question. Um, and please, Amanda, if you could please uh, lead this question again. Um, mm -hmm. Why are native, are native plants crucial for habitat restoration and climate resiliency? Uh, yes. So, um... You know, I just to kind of go back to your your native wildlife co-evolving with native plants. Um, there, these are historic relationships, and uh, these plants have evolved with the local environmental pressures, uh, like the climate, the topography, the soil composition, and then they in turn shape which herbivorous insects can be supported in any given season, and that also shapes what other wildlife depend on those plants and insects for food and so on. So native plants are the basis for nearly every terrestrial food chain. Um, and since they are in, uh, adapted to these local environment, environmental pressures, that means they can also tolerate the normal range of environmental conditions uh, in their native ranges. And that means they, they use less water than an exotic species would. They can right. tolerate the, the local temperature ranges. Uh, they have diverse mutualistic relationships with the soil organisms. And that's a really big issue because um, that's contributing to the uh, regulating um, ecosystem functions like carbon sequestration in the soil, um, flood and erosion control, and drought tolerance. Right. Thank you. That's extremely important, and some that those are some of the reasons why we consider most of our native plants resilient and um, easier to adapt to the extreme uh, effects of uh, climate change. So, and the steep uh, decline of monarch butterflies is linked to several factors, including climate change. And one of the impacts of climate change is the increased intensity and frequency of the extreme weather events. And uh, like prolonged droughts, unseasonal and extreme temperatures and heavy precipitations. And we just witnessed what um, a flooding in California due to the monarch uh, population overwintering in the California groves. So definitely this is, this is a big, big topic. So let alone the effects of climate change on plant phenology, which is also really crucial, that create a mismatch between native plants blooming and flowering and the arrival of the de or departure of the monarch butterflies. So it's really important for us to take into account how we will address the uh, conservation and restoration of habitats from now on. And it is important for us to ensure that we apply a climate lens when it comes to habitat restoration. And definitely uh, native plants is, is a great way to, to address this, this issue. And it will change from place to place depending on what the native plants are and there should be some research base to identify which native plants are more resilient to climate change and as we select those plants uh, those uh, plants will support the adaptation of not only the monarchs but, but many other wildlife species to climate change so the next question is um, for amanda we are keeping you busy, Amanda. I'm not trying to hog the spotlight. <laughs> so do native and non-native plants uh, add similar ecological values? So why, why those, those plants are more important? So, um, so native, native is a, a context dependent concept, right? Correct. So if we, if we imagine a native habitat, we might recognize 
all of the ecosystem functions, I mentioned that before, ecosystem functions that are associated with the species that would naturally occur there. So like the pollination services by the pollinators, the nutrient cycling by, you know, all of these deco decomposition, decomposers and plants moving uh, materials through providing food and shelter, you know, all these different things provide food and shelter. Um, so structural habitat and actual like nutritional habitat and then regulating the diseases and pests in a system. So when uh, non-native species are introduced to these systems, they're like out of context, so to speak. So they don't participate in these relationships with native species in the same way. Um, and that means like non-native non -native plants can become weedy or invasive if, they're predator, if their natural predators aren't present. Uh, they can harbor diseases and attract exotic pests. And that's a big problem, right? Because a lot of these exotic pests will find your ornamental plants or whatever, because they're, they're native to Europe or they're native to Asia. And they find, hey, buddy, I remember you. Um, and they, uh, they, they have different water or nutrient needs than the locally adapted species. So that means they, they can need more maintenance and resources than the native plant species. Thank you, Amanda. And uh, quickly, I will add uh, that also we need to consider that many uh, native pollinators are specialists, which means that they will look for spe species of specific native plants to nectar or uh, host their, their young. So that's the other reason why it is important to, to conserve and plant uh, native uh, plant species. So, Chris, uh, what are the documented impacts of, of non-natives like tropical milkweed and migratory monarchs? And you cover a lot of that in your presentation, but please. Yes, I did. I did talk about it a little bit. Uh, I'm going to present a couple more uh, studies, and then there should be more in the resources when everybody gets those. And these are all on about the eastern uh, eastern monarch population. I'm going to be talking about the studies. These are the ones that migrate to Mexico. And so some studies have been done on what we call resident monarchs, and those are monarchs that fail to migrate to Mexico and establish little populations uh, all year round in certain areas, usually in the south, along the Gulf Coast, and we have some here in Texas. What happens is that when they've uh, tested these monarchs, they uh, usually have a very, very high rate of OE, and their host plant and their nectar plant for the winter is generally tropical milkweed. Most of our native milkweed doesn't provide enough biomass in the winter to uh, have successive um, monarch generations use it as a host plant. So what they've, they've documented when these monarch butterflies are coming uh, back from Mexico, they are encountering and having uh, close contact with these monarch butterflies that are um, residents and with the milkweed that uh, often has a lot of the OE spores. And so that can present a problem to migratory monarchs. This is both in the fall and in the summer. They've done studies on that. Uh, second, there's there's actually some chemical properties with, within tropical milkweed that can present uh, physically a different monarch than, than ones raised on native milkweed. And one study showed that monarchs that were raised on tropical milkweed had less elongated wings, and this would co could compromise uh, long distance travel. Another one that was very uh, recent, a really interesting study that monarch butterflies raised on tropical milkweed had a higher flight metabolic rate. So they would require, they would use more calories when flying and probably a lot more calories when trying uh, to, to migrate. They would have to stop to nectar more often and use up their resources quicker. And we know that the monarch butterflies that overwinter in Mexico have to arrive with all of their resources, extra fat supplies. So how would these monarchs with higher metabolic rates be able to uh, sustain themselves through the winter? So some interesting questions these studies have brought up here for us. Thank you. Thank you, Chris. And um, what about the fact that uh, some other studies are indicating that exposure to the non-native tropical milkweed, um, especially in, in places with mild winters, like here in Texas, can trigger reproductive activity in monarchs and also delay the migration or even stop the migration of those, those monarchs. And one of our main concerns with all these issues is that the phenomenon of, of migration, which is one of a kind. And, and we are also aiming to protect and conserve that phenomenon. 
So um, how are native milkweed uh, different from tropical milkweed, Chris? Especially in, in places with mild winters, as yeah. we were Kind of touched on that a little bit, but uh, for one thing, tropical milkweed is the only evergreen uh, milkweed uh, native to the United States, except for one that is, I think, found in Arizona. It's a, it's a desert milkweed, so it doesn't affect the eastern population. So all of our native milkweed, even if we have a mild winter, it will only maybe retain a few leaves. It will have sometimes a green stem, but it is not actively growing. Tropical milkweed as an evergreen plant is growing all the time, as much in winter as it does in summer, and it will flower and reproduce uh, seeds in the summer. So so this is why it's it's a, a problem. It, it continues. It can it can host these uh, uh, sick monarchs and these resident uh, populations. So that's a difference. It is it is evergreen. Thank you. And um, Sam, if if you could please just scroll up to one uh, slide to see the differences, or we missed it. Okay, let's just uh, jump to the uh, what what is OE? <laughs> oh, oh, that's a different slide. Yeah, so can you go back to the slide that we had, Samantha? Thank you. Okay. This is going to be the short version. So this is Ophrocystis electroscara. It is a protozoan parasite that can infect any butterfly that uses milkweed as its host plant. Uh, it has kind of two, two forms, one that scientists call a spore that's kind of got a shell on the outside. It's viable, but, but dormant. And then there's the active uh, growing and reproducing uh, protozoa. So the adult butterfly is usually the main vector of transmission, especially mama butterfly. When the butterfly comes out of the chrysalis, they have a concentration of these OE spores on their abdomen, on their wings. And when mom goes to lay her eggs, she uses her abdomen to place that egg on the underside of a leaf. And usually um, she will add OE spores on the, on the eggs and on the leaf. So when the, when the little caterpillar eats its way out of that egg, it's eating the spores and it consumes the complete eggshell usually and eating more spores and starts consuming the milkweed where there's spores, wherever mom touches, she can leave those spores. So as soon as those spores get inside the little caterpillar, the digestive enzymes kind of break that kind of outside shell down and it releases those protozoa and they begin uh, growing and using the caterpillar's resources, you know, to multiply. And this goes on through the chrysalis stage, and uh, we can have millions and millions of these protozoa inside the chrysalis. About three days before the chrysalis is going to open and, and, get, and close one of our uh, butterflies, these uh, these protozoa begin shutting down, but as they're doing that, they are producing the spores. So I almost think about this as a, a flower, you know, flowering and then going dormant, but producing the seeds. And so these protozoa, when the butterfly comes out of that chrysalis, are in act, there's no active protozoa inside the butterfly, but they have the spores on the outside. A great deal of damage is usually done. Sometimes the chrysalis will not even give us a, a a butterfly it's too diseased but many resources are taken so the butterflies are often deformed their wings are very fragile they can't fly uh, for it causes many many different problems um, to test for oe project monarch health is our citizen science program that deals with oe you can order a kit from them you generally get a little piece of kind of it's like tape clear tape you gently touch the adult butterfly's abdomen with the tape put it on a, a white card and you can look at it underneath the microscope uh, about uh, at least 100 magnification. I like to look at it at 250 and you can see the little football shaped spores uh, easily on the microscope. So that's how you would test. Great, thank you. So um, our next uh, question would be, um, how could we differentiate between tropical milkweed? And for instance, you were mentioning before Asclepias tuberosa, which is very similar, so. Right, and I think, yeah, there's this, there's a slide for it. And I think I showed it during my presentation really quick. This is the most common confused uh, of, of the two and, and sold as such. So uh, you can see the, the tropical milkweed, it's it's usually the, the, I mean, the most common form is this yellow and red, but they also have a, uh, a yellow uh, variety and they have a, a solid red variety. For tuberosa, it's orange, 
There's a yellow variety of that now as well. And the orange can be kind of dark and look red. So the best way, the easiest way uh, is to look at the stem. And you can see that stem of that tuberosa has lots of little hairs. So do the leaves. The uh, tropical milkweed stem is completely is slick uh, and there's no hairs on it. So that is the best way to tell. Also, the tuberosa is low in cardinalides. It's, I think it's our lowest of our, of our um, milkweed. So if you break off a leaf, you will not get that milky lake and you will with the tropical but the best way is to look for the little hairs because the flowers do look very similar Rebecca you're muted thank you so thank you I was saying that this is really important and um uh, in uh there is a saying saying that uh, knowing how to differentiate will help us to not buy cat instead of rabbit. So that's that's really good. Thank you. So the next question, Amanda, is uh, what are some native milkweed species that support monarch breeding and migration in different regions across the U.S.? I'm muted. Sorry. I, I can really speak uh, mostly to um, the the Western uh, species. Um, I think it's really important to remember that native milkweed species should still be regionally appropriate. Um, so here in the West, where the Western population generally completes all of its uh, life cycle within the United States, certain milkweed species are going to be more appropriate to some regions than others based on how monarchs are using that habitat in those states. So like in California, especially in the Central Valley, I'd recommend planting California milkweed. That's Asclepius californica. And that's one of the early emerging species that are really critical for monarch survival because they're the first egg laying resource of the year for monarchs that are leaving the coastal overwintering grounds. Um, in the Intermountain West, like Utah, Idaho, uh, Upper Nevada, um, the showy milkweed and uh, swamp milkweed. Those are Asclepius speciosa and uh, Asclepius incarnata. Those are really common. They're found around rivers and wet meadows where monarchs are doing their summer breeding activities. They tend to be the most abundant in these in these wet areas. We do find a lot of monarchs in those in those um, wet regions. And then late in the summer, especially down in Arizona, when the monsoon rains are giving a boost to the last generation of monarchs that are going to migrate to overwintering grounds, Arizona milkweed, that's uh, Asclepius angustifolia, and the desert milkweed that would be found more across these drier regions, that's uh, Asclepius subulata. Those are really great choices there too. That's great, thank you. So I would add for um, uh, the central and uh, south of the, the United States, we have other species like uh, Asclepius asperula, Asclepias viridis, the Asclepias sonotheroides, also uh, Asclepias syriaca, Asclepias speciosa. Um, there are many species. And something that I, I really need to mention today is that just this year, Fish and Wildlife Service listed Asclepias prostata as an endangered species, which is extremely unfortunate. So we're now not only fighting the issues with monarch, monarch butterfly and the lack of habitat, but now also the fact that some of uh, the, the native milkweeds are being listed. And this is not the first native uh, milkweed that uh, Fish and Wildlife Service lists. Um, Stephanie, do you wanna mention a couple of uh, species for the Midwest? Sure. Um, Thank you. We have a few of the more widespread ones here on the slide as well. Common milkweed, Scopia syriaca in the lower left is the one that typically persists along roadsides or in pastures or old fields. That's a great one. The primary one that's feeding all of these monarch caterpillars. Um, top center pearled milkweed. This one is a much shorter and more delicate looking plant that's also native to drier grasslands and tolerates disturbed conditions as well. And uh, a great host plant for monarch caterpillars. It's also a little more suitable for some gardens because it's just less big compared to the, the common milkweed. And then uh, butterfly weed, low or bottom center and swamp milkweed, bottom right. Those um, are also native 
the butterfly weed to drier grassland habitat, swamp milkweed to wetter ones. But both of these are good choices for gardens and butterfly um, landscaping as well, because they kind of are, are more compact in their size. Thank you, Stephanie. And um, now that we have you on mute, uh, could you please tell us about where uh, can individuals go to find native plant and seed providers across the US? Sure, you can start your search online if that's available to you and several organizations. We'll just start with um, National Wildlife Federation has Native Plant Finder, which then connects to some retail availability. Um, the Xerxes Society has the Native Plant Seed and Services Directory. That is more focused on helping individuals find suppliers. It's got more descriptive information about suppliers, and then it's up to the seeker to uh, reach out to that supplier about what's in their particular inventory. Um, so those are some national resources. There are also statewide things like Choose Native Plants for Pennsylvania. Um, there is Grow Native for Missouri, CalScape in California, and many other states will have something similar. And then I'd also just like to end here by mentioning your local native plant society. Almost every state has a, a, a society and then with regional chapters, depending upon the size of the state. And those are great resources. You can find people who know a lot about native plants and cultivating them, as well as more local pop-up sales or brick and mortar stores that will supply them, whether they're plants or seeds. Uh, and of course, I'm muted. Thank you. So here, um, I would add to your list, uh, Stephanie, as you were saying, definitely the Native Plant Societies of the States are really important to reach out to to learn about uh, sources of uh, seeds and seedlings, as well as the master gardeners and the master naturalists. And also, I would, I would like to add uh, that the National Wildlife Federation that uh, Stephanie already mentioned, uh, we just started uh, with uh, a new enterprise, which is called Garden for Wildlife. And you can find gardenforwildlife.com where um, you will find that uh, uh, this enterprise is selling uh, native plant uh, kits for supporting monarchs and other pollinators uh, across the 38 states. And they are hoping to grow uh, this, this enterprise. So please uh, check that as well. And we will share some uh, resources with you uh, via email where we will be able to elaborate on uh, links and other um, uh, sources of information that you can use to find uh, sources of uh, native plants, but also to confirm what species are native to your region. Um, Chris, could you please uh, tell us if individuals can grow their own milkweed? Yes, absolutely. Uh, sometimes made of native milkweed kind of gets a bad rap that it's kind of hard to propagate. And actually, they're very similar to a lot of our prairie forbs, our prairie flowers, and that they need a winter to go through for the seeds to have good germination. And that's even, it's surprisingly uh, milkweeds that are native here in the South. They like that, uh, a lot of them like that winter, that winter cold to germinate. So we can mimic that by putting our milkweed seeds in uh, uh, what we call cold moist stratification, where we put them in some, some moist vermiculite in a baggie, put them in our refrigerator for a month to six weeks, bring them out and they readily germinate. Other milkweeds, some milkweeds do germinate well from fresh seed, but a lot of them do require this cold moist stratification. Uh, the Monarch Steward certification program with National Wildlife Federation has a three-part series of workshops and one of them is gardening for monarchs and other wildlife and during that we have an hour-long uh, presentation just on growing native milkweed. Thank you Chris and we will make sure to make that recording available to everyone as well soon. Um, yeah the next and last uh, question uh, Stephanie, if you could please uh, lead it, is uh, how can community science and community organizing uh, help increase awareness 
of the dangers of tropical milkweed and the benefits of native host and nectar plants. Yes, community science, that's something that used to be referred to as citizen science, but anyone can participate regardless of what your citizen status is. So we're switching more to calling this community science. And I think that word is also powerful because it brings people together to be excited and learn more and be passionate about these particular conservation causes. So I'll start just with highlighting two of the monarch related community science efforts that the Xerxes Society has. Um, one I mentioned in my earlier presentation and that's the Western Monarch Count. So that is limited to people um, who can be present along the West Coast where the overwintering grounds are, roughly between the holidays of Thanksgiving and New Year's. Um, there's training that's provided, you're assigned a site and you learn how to do the protocol and actually estimate the count of monarchs that are in the trees in those overwintering groves. So that's the Western monarch count. And then the numbers from that, it's, it's like very directly connected to how scientists measure the health of that Western population. So it's a really exciting uh, and direct way that anyone can contribute to conservation there. Right. And then, then the second is the Western Monarch Milkweed Mapper. A lot of partners have been involved in building that tool and funding it. And that is essentially a, a web where you create an account. And anytime you've observed a monarch egg, larva, chrysalis, or adult, or a milkweed plant, you can upload that observation there and it helps scientists know where monarchs are at which times of the year. And the same for milkweeds, we talked about climate change and how that can be affecting monarchs behavior and movement. And the same is true for milkweeds. When are they emerging and available for egg laying by the monarchs? When are they in flower and avail offering those, those resources to all the insects that visit them? When are they uh, dispersing seeds? in case anyone wants to base some seed collection efforts on that. So that's that's Monarch Milkweed Mapper. That's great. Thank you. Thank you, Stephanie. So I would uh, like to add uh, to that that uh, there have been significant contributions to monarch conservation since the monarch research started. And a great example is that the Monarch Biosphere Reserve, which was not called initially the way, but it was the overwintering grounds in Mexico has, uh, was founded by uh, two citizen scientists, Catalina Guado and Kenneth Brugger. So since then, citizen science or community science has greatly contributed to the knowledge of monarch butterfly, and which is crucial because of the wide range that the monarch has. It's just very complex for researchers to be everywhere. So we depend on uh, community science. Uh, there is a study indicating that two thirds of the monarchs on, uh, ongoing research is based on data collected by community scientists. So, and also contributions to the migration pathways, spread and prevalence of OE, monitoring of milkweed and monarchs present is definitely a great contribution that uh, community scientists could do. And um, we would like to uh, highlight uh, Chris Anastas. She's a great example of how far a community scientist can go. She has been a great contributor, a great educator, and, and it's just an honor to have her as a volunteer in Texas. So with uh, that, we have to close uh, the panel. I have to say that I'm quite honored to, to have uh, shared this time with Amanda Barr, Stephanie Frischi, and uh, uh, with Chris Anastas. And I truly appreciate your partnership, guys. And I hope that this is just the first panel of many more in the future. And I thank you everyone for being here today. And please uh, look for our emails. We will, sh we will be sharing the recording of this, this uh, panel and also uh, many more resources. Thank you everyone for being here today. Warning from
from the past To make sure you're learning from mistakes that you did last